Book One, Chapters One and Two of the Antiquities of the Jews. Recording by Ethan Rampton. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book One, Chapters One and Two. Chapter One The Constitution of the World and the Disposition of the Elements. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But when the earth did not come into sight, but was covered with thick darkness, and a wind moved upon its surface, God commanded that there should be light. And when that was made, he considered the whole mass, and separated the light and the darkness. And the name he gave to one was night, and the other he called day. And he named the beginning of light, and the time of rest, the evening and the morning. And this was indeed the first day. But Moses said it was one day, the cause of which I am able to give even now. But because I have promised to give such reasons for all things in a treatise by itself, I shall put off its exposition till that time. After this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world, and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament round it, and put it together in a manner agreeable to the earth, and fitted it for giving moisture and rain, and for affording the advantage of dews. On the third day he appointed the dry land to appear, with the sea itself round about it, and on the very same day he made the plants and the seeds to spring out of the earth. On the fourth day he adorned the heaven with the sun, the moon, and the other stars and appointed them their motions and courses, that the vicissitudes of the seasons might be clearly signified. And on the fifth day he produced the living creatures, both those that swim and those that fly, the former in the sea, the latter in the air. He also sorted them as to society and mixture for procreation, and that their kinds might increase and multiply. On the sixth day he created the four-footed beasts, and made them male and female. On the same day he also formed man. Accordingly Moses said that in just six days the world and all that is therein was made, and that the seventh day was a rest and a release from the labor of such operations. Whence it is that we celebrate a rest from our labors on that day, and call it the Sabbath, which word denotes rest in the Hebrew tongue. Moreover, Moses, after the seventh day was over, begins to talk philosophically, and concerning the formation of man, says thus, that God took dust from the ground, and formed man, and inserted in him a spirit and a soul. This man was called Adam, which in the Hebrew tongue signifies one that is red, because he was formed out of red earth, compounded together. For of that kind is virgin and true earth. God also presented the living creatures, when he had made them, according to their kinds, both male and female, to Adam, who gave them those names by which they are still called. But when he saw that Adam had no female companion, no society, for there was no such created, and that he wondered at the other animals which were male and female, he laid him asleep, and took away one of his ribs, and out of it formed the woman whereupon Adam knew her when she was brought to him, and acknowledged that she was made out of himself. Now a woman is called in the Hebrew tongue Isa, but the name of this woman was Eve, which signifies the mother of all living. Moses says further that God planted a paradise in the east, flourishing with all sorts of trees, and that among them was the tree of life, and another of knowledge, whereby was to be known what was good and evil, and that when he brought Adam and his wife into this garden, he commanded them to take care of the plants. Now the garden was watered by one river, which ran round about the whole earth, and was divided into four parts, and Phison, which denotes a multitude running into India, makes its exit into the sea, and is by the Greeks called Ganges. Euphrates also, as well as Tigris, goes down into the Red Sea. Now the name Euphrates, or Frath, 
denotes either a dispersion or a flower. By Tyrus or Diglath is signified what is swift, with narrowness, and Gion runs through Egypt and denotes what arises from the east, which the Greeks call Nile. God therefore commanded that Adam and his wife should eat of all the rest of the plants, but to abstain from the tree of knowledge, and foretold to them that if they touched it, it would prove their destruction. But while all the living creatures had one language, at that time the serpent, which then lived together with Adam and his wife, shewed an envious disposition, at his supposal of their living happily, and in obedience to the commands of God, and imagining that when they disobeyed them they would fall into calamities, he persuaded the woman, out of a malicious intention, to taste the tree of knowledge, telling them that in that tree was the knowledge of good and evil, which knowledge, when they should obtain, they would lead a happy life, nay, a life not inferior to that of a god, by which means he overcame the woman, and persuaded her to despise the command of God. Now when she had tasted of that tree, and was pleased with its fruit, she persuaded Adam to make use of it also. Upon this they perceived that they were become naked to one another, and being ashamed thus to appear abroad, they invented somewhat to cover them, for the tree sharpened their understanding, and they covered themselves with fig leaves, and tying these before them out of modesty, they thought they were happier than they were before, as they had discovered what they were in want of. But when God came into the garden, Adam, who was wont before to come and converse with him, being conscious of his wicked behavior, went out of the way. This behavior surprised God, and he asked what was the cause of this his procedure, and why he that before delighted in that conversation did now fly from it and avoid it. When he made no reply, as conscious to himself that he had transgressed the command of God, God said, I had before determined about you both, how you might lead a happy life, without any affliction and care and vexation of soul, and that all things which might contribute to your enjoyment and pleasure should grow up by my providence of their own accord, without your own labor and pains taking, which state of labor and pains taking would soon bring on old age, and death would not be at any remote distance. But now thou hast abused this my good will, and hast disobeyed my commands, for thy silence is not the sign of thy virtue, but of thy evil conscience. However, Adam excused his sin, and entreated God not to be angry at him, and laid the blame of what was done upon his wife, and said that he was deceived by her, and thence became an offender, while she again accused the serpent. But God allotted him punishment, because he weakly submitted to the counsel of his wife, and said the ground should not thenceforth yield its fruits of its own accord, but that when it should be harassed by their labor, it should bring forth some of its fruits, and refuse to bring forth others. He also made Eve liable to the inconveniency of breeding, and the sharp pains of bringing forth children, and this because she persuaded Adam with the same arguments wherewith the serpent had persuaded her, and had thereby brought him into a calamitous condition. He also deprived the serpent of speech, out of indignation at his malicious disposition towards Adam. Besides this, he inserted poison under his tongue, and made him an enemy to men, and suggested to them that they should direct their strokes against his head, that being the place wherein lay his mischievous designs towards men, and it being easiest to take vengeance on him that way. And when he had deprived him of the use of his feet, he made him to go rolling all along, and dragging himself upon the ground. And when God had appointed these penalties for them, he removed Adam and Eve out of the garden into another place. CHAPTER Two, CONCERNING THE POSTERITY OF ADAM and the ten generations from him to the deluge. Adam and Eve had two sons. The elder of them was named Cain, which name, when it is interpreted, signifies a possession. The younger was Abel, which signifies sorrow. They had also daughters. Now the two brethren were pleased with different courses of life, 
for Abel the younger, was a lover of righteousness. And believing that God was present at all his actions, he excelled in virtue, and his employment was that of a shepherd. But Cain was not only very wicked in other respects, but was wholly intent upon getting, and he first contrived to plough the ground. He slew his brother on the occasion following. They had resolved to sacrifice to God. Now Cain brought the fruits of the earth and of his husbandry, but Abel brought milk and the first fruits of his flocks. But God was more delighted with the latter oblation when he was honored with what grew naturally of its own accord than he was with what was the invention of a covetous man and gotten by forcing the ground. Whence it was that Cain was very angry that Abel was preferred by God before him, and he slew his brother, and hid his dead body, thinking to escape discovery. But God, knowing what had been done, came to Cain, and asked him what was become of his brother, because he had not seen him of many days, whereas he used to observe them conversing together at other times. But Cain was in doubt with himself and knew not what answer to give to God. At first he said that he was himself at a loss about his brother's disappearing, but when he was provoked by God, who pressed him vehemently, as resolving to know what the matter was, he replied, He was not his brother's guardian or keeper, nor was he an observer of what he did. But in return God convicted Cain, as having been the murderer of his brother, and said, I wonder at thee, that thou knowest not what is become of a man whom thou thyself hast destroyed. God therefore did not inflict the punishment of death upon him on account of his offering sacrifice, and thereby making supplication to him not to be extreme in his wrath to him. But he made him accursed, and threatened his posterity in the seventh generation. He also cast him, together with his wife, out of that land. And when he was afraid that in wandering about he should fall among wild beasts, and by that means perish, God bid him not to entertain such a melancholy suspicion, and to go over all the earth without fear of what mischief he might suffer from wild beasts. And setting a mark upon him, that he might be known, he commanded him to depart. And when Cain had travelled over many countries, he, with his wife, built a city named Nod which is a place so called, and there he settled his abode, where also he had children. However, he did not accept of his punishment in order to amendment, but to increase his wickedness. For he only aimed to procure everything that was for his own bodily pleasure, though it obliged him to be injurious to his neighbors. He augmented his household substance with much wealth, by rapine and violence. He excited his acquaintance to procure pleasures and spoils by robbery, and became a great leader of men into wicked courses. He also introduced a change in that way of simplicity wherein men lived before, and was the author of measures and weights. And whereas they lived innocently and generously while they knew nothing of such arts, he changed the world into cunning craftiness. He first of all set boundaries about lands. He built a city and fortified it with walls, and he compelled his family to come together to it, and called that city Enoch, after the name of his eldest son Enoch. Now Jared was the son of Enoch, whose son was Melaliel, whose son was Methuselah, whose son was Lamech, who had seventy-seven children by two wives, Scylla and Ada. Of those children by Ada, one was Jabel. He erected tents, and loved the life of a shepherd. But Jubal, who was born of the same mother with him, exercised himself in music, and invented the psaltery and the harp. But Tubal, one of his children by the other wife, exceeded all men in strength, and was very expert and famous in martial performances. He procured what tended to the pleasures of the body by that method, and first of all invented the art of making brass. Lamech was also the father of a daughter, whose name was Nema, and because he was so skillful in matters of divine revelation that he knew he was to be punished for Cain's murder of his brother, he made that known to his wives. Nay, even while Adam was alive, it came to pass that the posterity of Cain became exceedingly wicked, 
every one successively dying, one after another, more wicked than the former. They were intolerable in war, and vehement in robberies. And if any one were slow to murder people, yet was he bold in his profligate behavior, in acting unjustly, and doing injuries for gain. Now Adam, who was the first man, and made out of the earth, for our discourse must now be about him, after Abel was slain, and Cain fled away on account of his murder, was solicitous for posterity, and had a vehement desire of children, he being two hundred and thirty years old, after which time he lived other seven hundred, and then died. He had indeed many other children, but Seth in particular. As for the rest, it would be tedious to name them. I will therefore only endeavor to give an account of those that proceeded from Seth. Now this Seth, when he was brought up, and came to those years in which he could discern what was good, became a virtuous man. And as he was himself of an excellent character, so did he leave children behind him who imitated his virtues. All these proved to be of good dispositions. They also inhabited the same country without dissensions, and in a happy condition, without any misfortunes falling upon them, till they died. They also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies, and their order. And that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known, upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire, and at another time by the violence and quantity of water, they made two pillars, the one of brick, the other of stone. They inscribed their discoveries on them both, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain, and exhibit those discoveries to mankind, and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now this remains in the land of Syriad to this day. End of Book 1, Chapters 1 and 2